it's about time, right? We're almost 40 years into the epidemic and still grappling with how much it's interwoven with substance use. Decades of research and community mobilization have ushered in incredible advances in HIV treatment and prevention. But to end the HIV epidemic, these advances need to reach everyone who needs them, including people who use drugs like methamphetamine. In the past decade, researchers have seen higher risk patterns of meth use and meth-involved overdose increase in multiple U.S. populations. At the same time, researchers who study HIV and substance use have found an increasingly tight link between meth use and poor HIV outcomes. This is particularly true among sexual and gender minorities. One 2020 study estimates people who regularly use meth account for about one in three new HIV transmissions among sexual and gender minorities. Dr. Grove and Dr. Carrico are working on NIH-funded research to better understand how meth use among gay and bisexual men impacts HIV outcomes. So I'm wondering, why are gay and bisexual men who use meth a priority population for HIV research? The answer for that is you have to look at where the case numbers are happening and you let the epidemiological data guide you. And I'm seeing numbers and rates of particularly methamphetamine use increasing in our communities at a time when we've had PrEP for a decade and we're seeing a stubborn number of HIV infections in the United States that really isn't budging in light of this highly effective prevention tool. This highly effective prevention tool, PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, refers to medication that helps prevent HIV in HIV-negative people. So if the numbers aren't budging despite this, how do we end the HIV epidemic? We can't end the HIV epidemic without understanding the totality of individuals' lives. Can we hear that again? We can't end the HIV epidemic without understanding the totality of individuals' lives. And I think a lot of times we segregate issues of substance use from other aspects of HIV prevention or for other aspects of healthcare. And what this really underscores to me is the extent to which this holistic approach, this really understanding human beings and their full experience is what we need to end the epidemic. I realized how much of like drug use and the addiction was really rooted around me, fears of like connecting to people and being myself. And I started to have friends that cared about me for the first time. And I started to care about myself for the first time. And I realized like, this doesn't have to be the end of my story anymore. The researchers I spoke to explained that HIV and meth use are linked in several ways. Meth can cause changes in the body that may make it more vulnerable to HIV, and it can also influence sexual behavior in similar ways. The way that substances impact HIV, and I'm going to particularly focus on methamphetamine, is behaviorally. We see behavioral disinhibition for people that are using meth. If they're combining it with sex, they're going to have probably more partners, have more sex, have sex for a longer period of time, and condoms may be less likely to be used if they're being used at all. I think drugs and sex, especially for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, are a real cultural phenomenon, uh, that people are mixing drugs and sex for pleasure, uh, often to enhance sexual pleasure. When you come from a community where having um, sex with someone of the same sex is a really fraught experience that's looked down upon, um, combining that with something like meth can really improve the experience as well and help you not think about the aspects of it that might make you feel shame um, for doing it. Crystal meth for me has a lot to do with sexual, social, emotional, loneliness. It satisfies a lot of different aspects of my life that continue to be at issue. The question is, how can we make sure that those folks are kept as safe as possible um, within the context of that behavior? I remember the first time I did crystal meth, I felt sexy and I felt connected. I've never done meth without the, without having sex. And sometimes that can lead to outcomes they don't want, right? Like having different types of sex or sex in, with multiple partners. Um, and other times it can lead to a fun night. Uh, so, you know, it's really a wide array of different kinds of experiences that we see guys having uh, when they're partying and playing. In this case, 
Partying and playing or chem sex means using drugs as part of your sex life. Gay and bisexual men who party and play report doing so for a variety of reasons. Some say it makes them less inhibited and increases pleasure or that they mix meth and sex to address issues in their sex life and self-esteem. So how risky is this? The problem with risk is that that's a public health term, right? And the minute that we put this risk frame on the conversation, it's alienating. And it makes a, an individual think that I am placing a judgment on that behavior by labeling it as a risk behavior. And it wasn't just like, hey, I'm doing drugs and I'm not going to have a condom. It was like, I don't want to have a condom. This is like the barrier to me connecting, like the barrier to me being sexual. And this is a person I always want to be and there's no consequences in my mind. People use meth for a lot of different reasons. And people who use meth may have a lot of different goals for their health and life, from staying safer while using meth to working towards long-term recovery from meth addiction. It was recovery the goal. The goal was just not to die. And I didn't know how to live. People have all sorts of goals uh, with regard to their substance use that we can help them meet. There are all sorts of ways that we can engage clients and participants in our research studies in setting goals for behavior change that really match their values and goals in that moment without demanding that they be abstinent to even uh, receive the benefits of counseling. Complexity is the rule and not the exception um, of the lives uh, of the men we serve. I think that at the, at the root of my pain is pain, but I know that the use of this drug exacerbates a lot of things, a lot of things that I'm aware of and a lot of things that I'm probably not aware of. I don't think that kicking meth is a solution to all my problems and that everything will just be fine. But I do think that it's one thing that's for certain that things will get better. How do we talk about HIV in a way that's inclusive of gay and bisexual men who are using drugs or even experiencing addiction? How can research help us see the light at the end of the tunnel where those in need are affirmed and validated in healthcare spaces? One way maybe to close the research gap. You know, let's get a clearer picture of the totality of people's lives from HIV to substance use and beyond. To learn more about substance use and addiction research, log on to nida.nih.gov. If you or someone you care about wants help, you can learn more by calling the National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP or by visiting findtreatment.gov.
one of the most important things we can do to improve public health is to restore trust um, in patients for their providers. So often the great divide between patient and provider is trust. You know, people who use drugs are often refuse the same access to HIV services and care offered to others. Stigma and discrimination in healthcare has been a crisis all its own, and that crisis has created a barrier to care for people who use meth, including gay and bisexual men. How do providers provide compassionate care for men who are all too often stigmatized and discriminated against? That is what I needed to know. So I think it's really important to, to meet people where they are at and to not judge them uh, for anything that they're doing, whether it's not using condoms, whether it's using methamphetamine. There's this tension, and I think that there's this very real need to help people, right? And one very common strategy is what I refer to as the um, don't you know strategy. The don't you know that meth use can harm you? Don't you know that unprotected sex can lead to X and Y, right? Don't you know? And we feel this uh, incredibly profoundly, this need because, and I think it's motivated from love, right? It's motivated often from love for the community. I love you. I need you to stop doing this. But the problem is there's two problems. One is I would challenge you to find a smoker who does not know that smoking causes cancer, right? And so if I already know it, then what I perceive you to be saying to me when you say to me, don't you know, is you're trying to make me scared and you're trying to shame me. And people know when they're being listened to and it, and it, it brings out trust. And for many of us, I don't know, people from marginalized groups, there's already so many layers of distrust and fear and shame, this is the second piece, are the most alienating of experiences. And so anytime we, we root these messages in fear or shame, we are by definition alienating individuals from the acceptance of that message and from hearing us at all. And what they hear is, you don't care about me. And that to me is the most damaging thing about this type of messaging. There's a better way for us to treat people who use drugs without judgment. When you get to something that is highly stigmatized, like substance use, you want to create a space where somebody can be honest with their provider about what they're doing so that their provider can give them the best treatment possible. And that's the important elements of why it's important to meet your clients where they are at, because then they will be honest with you about what's going on in their lives. I have enough shame already that I'm bringing to myself. I don't need to look at somebody else's face and see them judging me or imagine that they're judging me. A lot of this is really thought to stem from uh, the experiences of social stigma and rejection uh, that sexual minority men experience. That can often be multi-layered, right? We think about uh, intersecting identities, like being a drug user, being an ethnic minority man. There are lots of ways that guys experience stigma in their communities. So. For me, the best definition of stigma is the linking of social judgments about a particular characteristic, in this case, a behavior, to a person who is engaging in that behavior. And that linking is profoundly a form of social control. What are some of the ways healthcare providers can start the process of restoring the trust of people who use drugs? They're humans. Their need is health care. Their need is to be understood. Their need is to be taken care of judgment free. Their need is to be safe. Their need is to have a place to be where they can just come and express themselves and be themselves. Ask your patients, what's going on? Are you using, tell me about it in a non-judgmental way? Because I think Many times in prep clinics, STI clinics, or general medical uh, doctor visits, people are uncomfortable disclosing, right? They're uncomfortable initiating that discussion about their substance use. And so just asking can really open that, uh, that dialogue. Tell me your biggest concern um, about substance use right now. That type of question 
might enable a person to actually have a conversation about their life as opposed to a litany of, do you do this? Do you do this? How often do you do this? How often do you do this? And might really focus on the piece that the provider actually needs to help them with most. My psychiatrist really asks me questions and makes me think about things. He's earned my trust by asking questions that really mean something. One of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we need to only ask questions that we're going to do something with the answers. You ask people about themselves, not in a way of getting in their business just to know, but what can I do for you? What are the services you're looking for? What can I provide for you? Because that's what we're here for, right? And even though I have used, I've always not wanted to use, and I think that that's been a part of my seeking out people that are going to help me and point me in the right direction. Working in healthcare settings and in medical units, it's widely accepted that drug users can be stigmatized and mistreated. And that is really one of the major things that drove me to do this work is to try and find ways that we can reshape the experience of healthcare uh, for people who use drugs like methamphetamine um, and deliver I think more compassionate and integrated care. I hope that the work that we're putting out there not only speaks to the scientific community, but it also speaks to um, you know, health professionals that are working with people who are using substances to see their clients where they're at, to meet their clients where they're at, to recognize that this is going on within these communities and asking the best questions to get the best treatment for these individuals. There's so much like shame about queerness there's shame about my addiction that I had to deal with. There's definitely shame about the HIV that I had to deal with. And once I like addressed the fact that there was shame and I started talking about it and started being real and being vulnerable, that's when I started to connect. You allow them to speak to you freely. You allow them to express what they are comfortable expressing without digging too deep. Of course, first visit, they may not give you all of that because they don't know you yet. But that's why you allow them to just speak freely, you allow them to know that you're there for them and you welcome them back. And isn't that just it? Despite the stigma and discrimination, being allowed the autonomy to own your vulnerability and allowing that vulnerability to lead you to a healthier you, you know, lack of trust might be the great divide, but building that trust back can be the game changer. People living at the intersection of substance use, HIV, queerness, and race deserve more. So let's keep listening. If you or someone you care about wants help, you can learn more by calling the National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP or by visiting findtreatment.gov. To learn more about substance use and addiction research, log on to nida.nih.gov.